he said he said no horror movie can ever uh, capture the cruelty of what they did to me and then he called out to jesus jesus came rescued him um and then ultimately he uh, is revived he comes back his spirit re is reunited with his body he, he re resumes consciousness he not only um, rejects his atheism he not only becomes a christian he becomes an ordained pastor and to this day is the pastor of a tiny little church I believe it's in Oklahoma so what is in this book uh, the case for, for heaven this is uh, your discussions with people who have seen uh, who have experienced these kinds of things yeah I interviewed neuroscientists for instance and and others on the question of um, what do near-death experiences really tell us because uh, I was a skeptic about those I thought no wait they're just hallucinations that's just uh, oxygen so even as a Christian brain. you were a skeptic about yeah. this stuff it, it, I didn't think that the science supported it. I thought okay I can believe what the Bible says but certainly near-death experiences are just mythology and make-believe and wishful thinking but what I learned was that there have been 900 scientific articles written about near-death experiences over the last 40 years and published in scientific and medical journals. This is a very well-researched area of science. In fact, The Lancet, which is the famous medical journal in England, did an article that said that when you look at all of the alternative explanations for near-death experiences, oh, it's oxygen deprivation. So none of those explanations explain what actually takes place. And then I interviewed John Burke for my book. John Burke is a Christian pastor in Austin, Texas. He has studied a thousand near-death experiences over 35 years. And his conclusion, which was radical to me, is that when you look at the core of what happens in these near-death experiences, um, yes, there are some differences, but look at the core of what actually takes place. Don't look at how people interpret it, but look what actually occurs. It is consistent with Christian theology. That was very important to me. And, and you mentioned the word corroboration, and I'm with you. I mean, you know, when somebody tells me, oh, I died and I met Jesus and he's five foot ten, has brown eyes, I mean, I go, oh, okay, well, I can't corroborate that. But when we have a study that was done of 21 blind people, most of them blind since birth, who during their near-death experiences could see for the first time. Um, for instance, Vicki Umatpeg, she was 26 years old, blind since birth car accident. She's declared dead. Um, and yet she later says, I, my spirit separated from my body. I watched the resuscitation of her. I saw people for the first time. She'd never even seen shadows before. So I saw people for the first time. I saw plants. I saw trees. I saw animals. And, and, and then when her spirit returned to her body and she was revived, her eyesight disappeared again. And one medical researcher said, this is medically impossible. This just can't happen. And yet we have multiple corroborative cases like that. And of course, the most famous one involves a, a woman named Maria who was um, uh, died in the hospital of a heart attack. And yet she says, I was alive the whole time. I watched the resuscitation efforts, but my, my spirit floated out of the hospital. And then when her spirit returned and was reunited and, and her body was reanimated, she said, by the way, there's a man's tennis shoe on the third story ledge, the roof of the hospital. And it's dark blue. It's left footed. It's a man's shoe. Uh, there's some wear over the little toe and the shoelace is tucked under the heel. And so they go on the roof and guess what? <laughs> they find the exact now, shoe. Now, Lee, I'm pretty sure that could just be a coincidence. <laughs> can you can we believe like god is so amazing and so funny yeah i mean that that's what yeah. he chooses to do to blow people's yeah. minds he could do anything but he yeah. chose that huh. specific um yes now of course i want you to write another book about who was the guy that lost his shoe and why was it there <laughs> but i mean why is this on the roof right that is that i've never heard anything like yeah. that that's you know because you hear all yeah. these stories that the doctors were in this corner of the room and they did this and that, and it's right. all true but this is right. a level of specificity uh and altitude which is really impressive yes yeah that's right there was another case where a woman um 31 year old housewife from atlanta georgia had a brain aneurysm so she got bleeding in her brain they had to do a radical surgery so they get her into surgery they cool her body to 60 degrees first then they it drained every drop of blood from her head. Three clinical tests showed there was zero brain activity. 
no breathing, no heartbeat. She was clinically dead. They put earphones, uh, uh, earplugs in her ears with 100 decibels of noise, which is like a subway train going next to you. And they taped her eyes shut. And yet she said, I was conscious the whole time. And I, I, I even met deceased relatives. I, I was in the very presence of God. And when her spirit returned to her body, uh, she was able to describe the highly unusual surgical tools that were used during her surgery. She was able to describe the conversations in the surgical suite when she said, one nurse said, we have a problem, our arteries are too small. Another nurse said, well, let's try the other leg. And then she was even able to know that during the surgery, they were playing the song Hotel California in the background. The Eagles, <laughs> one of my favorite bands, although that's yeah. a, that's story, that, that song's a little dark, but... Uh, it's kind of scary because it's like you can check in, but you can never check out. Yeah. I, I don't think I'd want that being played during yeah, my surgery. Yeah, man. But That's kind of some dark case. tunage for a near-death experience. But I got to say <laughs> that, you know, the idea, I actually do, do mention this in my book, Is Atheism Dead? John Lennox talks about yeah. this. He says, the brain yes. is not the mind and the mind is not the brain. So here they Ex drain exactly. all the blood out of her brain. The brain is, there's no brain, yep. but she right. and her mind continue yes. so the brain That's is right. not the mind your your brain will rot exactly. and you will continue to exist we have to go to a break uh we'll find out okay. what's on the other side of the break in just a moment don't go away i am so fascinated by this you were just about to say something before we went yeah. to the break well you made a very important point eric which is that we're not reducible to our brain we are more than our physical brain Brain. And how do we know that? Because there's a difference between our brain, our physical brain, and our consciousness, our mind, or our spirit, our soul. And the example that was given to me by the neuroscientist from Cambridge University, who I interviewed, Dr. Sharon Dirix, PhD from Cambridge, a well-known neuroscientist, who wrote a book called, Am I Just My Brain? And the answer is, no, you're not. But she gave an illustration. She said, what if there was a woman named Mary? And Mary was the world's leading expert on vision. She understood the physical makeup of the eye, how it was constructed, the physics, the chemistry, how the eye functions, how um, images are carried through the uh, optic nerve, how, how the brain f um, processes that. She understands it better than anybody in the world, but she's blind. What if all of a sudden for the first time, Mary received her eyesight? At that moment, would Mary learn anything new about vision? <laughs> yeah, she would. She'd be able to see. She'd have the first person experience of seeing. No amount of knowledge about the physical working of the eye and the brain would get Mary to that point of that first person experience of seeing. And so consciousness and the brain are not the same thing. Consciousness or the, the, well, the soul or the spirit don't, is, is distinct from the human brain. Don't you find it funny? Whenever you hear t people talk about, you know, the idea that the brain's a computer, blah, 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 blah. And you, you, <laughs> right. you say, w what is consciousness? I mean, this is heavy stuff. Yeah. But when yeah. is it that you become conscious? Computers are not conscious. How big does a computer have to That's be before right. it makes the leap to consciousness? It will never make the leap to consciousness exactly. because that, you know, a brain is different from a mind. And when you're talking about That's this, right. I mean, this is very heavy and there are scientists yeah. who have really puzzled over this. And there's some people who just sort of assume right. that, well, of course we live in a material universe. Uh, but they, that leap, it's an infinite leap. You can never make the leap yeah, from computer to consciousness. That's exactly right. And, and there really is, I believe, no rational explanation uh, from the materialists who believe we are just our brain to explain consciousness. So you either say it's an illusion, which a lot of materialists, people who just believe the physical world is all there is, they will say consciousness is an illusion. Free will, Sam Harris says, free will is an illusion. Really? Is that a livable worldview? Not even is that close. a logical no. worldview? No. Not even close. So I think you're absolutely right. And you know, the Bible says that there's, there's really two aspects of the afterlife for believers. Uh, when we die, our spirit, our soul, our consciousness separates from our body. We go to an intermediate state and we're either present with Jesus in paradise or we're separated from God in Hades. And then the second phase begins 
uh, when Jesus returns at the consummation of history, we're united with our now resurrected bodies. Uh, we go through final judgment and then we spend eternity in a very physical place, whether heaven or hell. So this question, you know, when Jesus said truly to the repentant criminal on the cross, truly today will be with me in paradise. And, and the apostle Paul says to be absent from the bodies present with the Lord this suggests that indeed our our soul does separate from our physical body. And science is telling us near-death experiences, as I say, which are documented in 900 scientific studies, um, telling us this is consistent with what the Bible tells us. I really believe... Um, and, we, and that's huge. I, I really believe uh, we're, we're on the verge of uh, revival and reformation because I really think that yes. science... And again, that's the thesis of my new book, but... The, yeah, there is the evidence is piling up, and it has to do with the yes. internet and whatever. Somehow, ever the information's exploding. It's harder and harder yeah. and harder to avoid. Uh, the yes. science is 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 getting us farther and farther. So we can see these things yeah. that we could have pretended ignorance, or we could have pretended like who's to say. Less and less are we able to say who's to say. The evidence yeah. is here and here and here, and it piles up and up and up. And you have to be kind of willful in looking away from it. Right. So I think we're kind of on the verge of something in the West. I'm very hopeful. Yeah, let's let's follow the science. <laughs> so if you follow the science of cosmology, the origin of the universe, uh, if you follow the science of physics, which is the fine tuning of the universe, if you follow the science of uh, DNA and you look at the biological information in every cell in the human body, this all points toward a supernatural creator whose qualities happen to match the same description of the God of the Bible. So That's, I agree with you. I think that, that science is pointing increasing. These are only discoveries over the last 50 or 60 years. So you know, that's this what's is so funny. Stuff. Again, that's when you when you read my book, you'll you'll know like this is exactly where I came out. It's also where Stephen Meyer uh, comes out in his book, yes. The Return of the God Hypothesis, on a higher level, right. on a more writing on a more popular right. level. But it's it's called logic, and the fact is that right. in the last fifty that's or sixty right. years, it's bad news for the materialist because we yes. didn't have the science that we now have now. You can't really yeah. say, is God dead? Because all the evidence has just piled up while we were kind of in this fantasy that we could live in a secular world. And uh, it's it's just yeah. no longer it's no longer possible. Um, when did this book come, well, come I, out? I even, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it just came out uh, recently in, in uh, uh, September. And what I, one of the things I do in it is I have what I call the pyramid to heaven. I interviewed a, a philosopher, a famous philosopher about this. And, and so he said, let's, let's, let's start at the broadest question. What is truth? We'll establish what is truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. Uh, look, forgive me. I didn't realize we're views. bumping into a hard break. This sounds uh, okay. brilliant. This sounds amazing. So as soon as we come back, we're going to hear about the pyramid to heaven. With Lee Strobel, don't go yep. away. The book is The Case for Heaven. Lee, you were just t uh, talking about this... Uh, person who came up with this idea called the yeah. pyramid of heaven right. so go ahead what is right. that idea sure his name by the way is dr chad meister and he was an atheist for much of his life uh, he was on the verge of suicide literally had the gun cocked and ready to kill himself when god uh, supernaturally re reached out to him he became not only a christian but he's one of the world's foremost christian philosophers now um, and so I interviewed him for my book and he said, let's just build a pyramid. Let's start with the broadest issue, the base of the pyramid. What is truth? Well, truth is that which corresponds to reality. OK, well, then next step on the pyramid is what are what worldviews are there? Well, there only can be three atheism pantheism, which is that everything is God or theism, that there is an, a God who we are accountable to. We look at are those. Each one of those worldviews, are they livable and are they logical? And we conclude that atheism is neither livable nor uh, logical, neither is pantheism, and yet theism survives. And I, I, wanna, I just want to interrupt you before you go on. Yeah. We need to be clear, and this is what I concluded in my book, Is Atheism Dead? You can talk all you want about being an atheist, but it is not livable. You, cannot, you can That's say right. you're an atheist. I mean, I can say... Uh, I'm a canary. I could say whatever I want, right. but you cannot right. live consistently as though there is no God, there is no meaning, there isn't. You cannot do it. But this is this is yeah. uh, this philosopher uh, concludes that. But he yes. also says the same about pantheism. He does, and and pantheism is internally inconsistent, and it's it's unlivable. 
Um, besides which, by the way, in pantheism, there's no heaven. Uh, there's nirvana. What is nirvana? Nirvana has been described as what's left after you blow out a candle. Uh, it's the <laughs> extinguishing of yourself. I mean, you, you, you're you extinguished, ultimately. It, there's so many inconsistencies in pantheism. It can't be true. And yet theism is internally consistent. Is and it, it is is, but wait a minute. Is pantheism is like where you, where you say, I become one with everything? Yes, it's uh, reincarnation. Isn't it? But it's isn't reincarnation. That, is that isn't that the Buddhist hot dog? What did what did the what did he, what did the Buddhist hot dog vendor say? Or no, what do you say to a Buddhist hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! I, I never, that's to, good. I, I had like to put that. in just a really cheap, stupid joke in case people. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. All right, uh, so but let's keep no, going. No, so pantheism good. doesn't yeah. work. Atheism doesn't work. So right. you're left with theism. There's one you're God. Left with theism. Okay. Exactly. And then you look at Revelation. You look at, okay, well, um, can we trust what the Bible tells us? Can we trust the New Testament? Uh, is it essentially reliable in what it tells us about the life, teachings, miracles, death, and resurrection of Jesus? And we conclude, yes, it is reliable. Then we look at the resurrection evidence inside and outside the Bible that confirm and corroborate that Jesus didn't just claim to be the Son of God. He backed up that claim by returning from the dead. So the pyramid's getting narrower and narrower. And then finally, at the tip of the pyramid is the gospel. Um, and when we get to that point, we're reaching heaven. I mean, that's the doorway that we can enter into heaven. So it's kind of a way of looking at looking at the broadest possible and working our way to the conclusion that the Christian teaching is that which makes sense and which is livable. It's, I just want to say it's so important for us to understand that our faith is real and it's logical. And whenever anybody Absolutely. says that's not true— we, we have yeah. to know that they're mistaken. We don't have to say, like, well, I think yeah. they're mistaken. You have to know, just like the way you know, yeah. you know, science is real, math is real. This is not just what yeah. we want. And, and I think that the, there are a lot of people that they just want to look away. They want to believe what they want, yeah. or they've been wounded uh, yeah. or, or, or something. Um, have, do you have any stories in this book, The Case for Heaven, where people experience life after death and it's not heaven but yes. hell yes absolutely howard storm howard storm was an atheist he was a professor at a secular university and the head of the art department he dies in the hospital but then he said yeah they're saying i'm dead but i'm standing next to my body uh, he's still alive his soul is still alive and and some guys in the hallway say hey come with us. And so he's okay. So he follows him down the hallway of the hospital and then down another corridor, down another corridor. And finally said, where are we going? We've been walking forever. And they started to get, get mean to him and, and started clawing him and biting him and, and, and swearing at him. And they literally, as he said, they reduced me to roadkill. His eye was gouged out. His ear was chewed off. And he said, he said, no horror movie can ever uh, capture the cruelty cruelty of what they did to me. And then he called out to Jesus. Jesus came, rescued him. Um, and then ultimately he uh, is revived. He comes back. His spirit re is reunited with his body. He, he re resumes consciousness. He not only um, rejects his atheism, he not only becomes a Christian, he becomes an ordained pastor. And to this day is the pastor of a tiny little church. I believe it's in Oklahoma. Um, it radically changed like 24% of these near death experiences are hellish experiences or they are, um, negative experiences in some way. Um, now it's important to understand that people in near death experiences, they're dead. They've been declared dead. Some in the morgue and yet they're, they're not irreversibly dead. You know, the Bible talks about you are appointed once to die and then the judgment. Well, they're not dead in an irreversible way because they're going to come back. So they're clinically dead. Um, and that's well, like why, Lazarus. Uh, exactly. That's exactly right. And so um, as a result, we can have a situation where Jesus, this is postmortem, so to speak. He calls out to Jesus and Jesus rescues him. Um, I'm not sure we all can count on that uh, when we're irreversibly dead. You know what that's, I mean? That's the um, horror. I think we have to be honest, yeah. Lee. I, I don't exactly. want to believe hell is real, but the evidence seems to suggest that it is. The Bible suggests yes. strongly that this is what it is. And then you hear stories. Yeah. C.S. Yeah. Lewis, uh, there's a new film out called The Most Reluctant Convert. People can go see it. Yes. I recommend it highly. But C.S. Lewis talks about a friend, I think it was when he was in World War I, and one of them, he'd mm. been dabbling in the occult. And as he was dying, he's screaming out, you know, these, de these devils are clawing at me. Help me, help me. I mean, yeah. It, it, it just yeah. seemed obvious. 
what is happening. It's you horrific. hear these stories, it's and we need to take this seriously, folks. It's it's yeah. absolutely horrific, but we need to face it. Um, I have two chapters in the book on hell because I knew I couldn't write an, a, a book about the afterlife without dealing. Um, with hell. And I deal with two of the ways in which a lot of young pastors are trying to soften hell a bit. Uh, one is through teaching universalism, that ultimately we're all saved. We're going to meet Adolf Hitler in heaven, um, and, and, which is a heresy. And then some pursue what's called annihilationism, yeah. which means that when you die, God snuffs you out of existence. You don't go to hell for eternity. I, when we come back, I want to explore both of those. This is very important, yeah. folks. I hope you don't uh, go away. Uh, we'll be right back with Lee Strobel. The book is The Case for Heaven. Lee, your book is called The Case for Heaven, <laughs> but you talk about how some past Pastors uh, are trying to, I don't know, blur, blur the line and say, well, not really. Uh, yeah. Everybody ends up in heaven. I wish, but I, I don't. Yeah. I don't see how that's possible. But I, I wish. I right. mean, with the thought of this is so horrifying. Uh, so they talk about universalism, or they talk about annihilationism. That maybe yeah. we just we are blown out like a candle, it's and that is it. Yeah. Those two are very popular. We can say about universalism, there's so many passages in Scripture that are dependent on you responding to the gospel message. John 1, 12, the last verse I read as an atheist that brought me to faith, that says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So the, the formula is believe plus receive equals become. We have to receive God's grace. There's too many passages that uh, make eternal life contingent on our response to God. And annihilationism, now, John Stott, the great evangelical pope, so to speak, of the 20th century, ended up believing in annihilationism. Um, it, it's not a heresy. It's a secondary issue. Um, uh, you can make a really good biblical case for it. And I do in the book. In fact, I talked to an annihilationist who said, I read your book. Thank you for spelling out our case very accurately. They can make a good case, but it's it falls short, I believe. Although and, I want to uh, say to people, if you really, 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 really think about annihilationism, you should be utterly horrified of that. That's that's <laughs> exactly. not a good thing. Uh, it that's is really, really that most sick. People don't make. You're exactly yeah. right. Most people say, "Oh yeah, that, well that wouldn't be bad." No, are you serious? Oh, Do you want to be oh, snuffed out of existence for eternity? For eternity. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, we're, we're living in times where people don't, you know, it's kind of the same old uh, complaint in a way, but that, that a lot of people from pulpits are not talking about these uncomfortable things. Maybe yeah. because people in the past have spoken about these things insensitively or somehow wrongly. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we shouldn't be, well, I mean... Uh, shouldn't be gloating it, over it. it, it, it <laughs> no, no, and we should be weeping at the very idea yes. that anyone could ever possibly go to hell. It's horrifying, and we exactly. should do everything we can to to, to, to tell people uh, that there's something beautiful. It's God's intention yeah. for them. Um, yes. Unless you're Presbyterian Calvinist, in which case, who's to say? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we've just got a minute left. What do we... Uh, what do we say? Uh, I'm just oh. so glad you wrote this book, Lee. The case for heaven. I really, I'm just, I'm excited about it. People need to know, Thanks. life is life is tough enough. We need to know mm -hmm. uh, where we are supposed to go and uh, where the Lord wants us to go. Yeah. Um, Can I say one last thing? Yes, anything. Um, I interviewed Luis Palau, the great evangelist. Oh. I was the last person to interview him before he died. And he said something to me, Eric, I think is relevant to all of us. Here he is. He knows he's about to die. He shared his faith with a billion people during his lifetime. Great man of God. And he said to me, Lee, when you get to the end of your life and all is said and done, you will never regret being courageous for Christ. That's a message for all of us. Um, Luis Palau was a, was a friend, and I just loved yeah. him so much. I did, too. And I yeah. could see the joy of Jesus in him. Yes. And that's the way we're supposed to go out of this life, knowing that there is that's no right. question that where we're going is infinitely better than wherever yeah. we are. We need to know that. We shouldn't hope that, folks. Yeah. Don't hope it. Know it. You will live yes. differently. Uh Lee, I'm just grateful yeah. for you generally, particularly grateful for this book, The Case for Heaven. Thank you for your time well, and thanks, for writing Eric. this important book. God bless you.